Chapter 17, Non-Renewable Energy Resources. Chapter 17 starts off talking about coal. <clears throat> We've depended on coal for a long time on this planet. We still burn coal. Most of the world still does burn some amount of coal. And that's <clears throat> at least partly because it's one of the more abundant resources and one of the least expensive resources. But the downside is that as long as coal continues to be a major energy source, it's going to continue to create environmental problems. In a lot of the uh, countries around the world, coal isn't even being burnt using the most modern technology that we employ in the developed countries like the U.S. And so this type of contamination then is going to affect the air, the water, uh, our, our soil, our groundwater, and that won't go away with the use of coal. Even though the technology that we have available can remove particulates and some of the other major contaminants like sulfur that can lead to acid rain and mercury, we can't fix the release of CO2. There have been a lot of people looking at ways to deal with that, including pumping it directly underground and storing it <clears throat> in places where uh, we might have already extracted all the oil or natural gas, but uh, that's not really feasible at this point. And I guess one thing that's really bugged me about coal is, is especially the last several years, there have been all these commercials on TV about clean coal. And I, I finally saw some article oh, last week talking about clean coal and, and kind of my thought was reinforced there that while there is and are cleaner ways to burn coal, technologies that, you know, eliminate some of the pollutants, there's no such thing as clean coal. It is a very polluting resource. And there is really, again, no way to completely remove all the, the contaminants that are generated when you burn coal. Our biggest challenge and, and problem, really, on this planet is that we depend on energy. We obviously, as we developed and industrialized, found different sources of energy, including some of the alternative sources that we'll talk about in the next chapter, <clears throat> but we still heavily depend on the consumption of non-renewable resources. Things that once they're gone, they're gone. And because we depend on energy for everything, as listed here, cooking, food, heating and cooling our house, making other products, especially things like transportation, as long as all of those things that we do every day and depend on so heavily <clears throat> are supplied by fossil fuels, we're never going to get out of this situation of, of creating pollution and, and not being able to solve that problem. As you probably already know, the per capita consumption of energy is much higher in the developed countries like the U.S. than in the developing countries. Some percentages you probably ought to make note of. About a third of the total energy in the United States is used for industry. So manufacturing, processing all the products that we depend on. 28% is used for transportation, which is, again, still a huge percentage for just one thing like transportation. Although, of course, that includes not only our own cars, but also airplanes, <clears throat> and then um, ships, semi-trucks, trains, all of the things that uh, we need for shipping all the products we depend on around the country and, and around the world. But the bulk of energy use is consumed by buildings, whether it's our homes or commercial buildings, 41% of our energy is used to heat and cool uh, buildings to provide electricity, and so forth. Obviously, in developing countries, 
the amount of industrial energy use is lower, uh, but then household use actually is higher. And the figure on the right of this slide shows basically per capita the, the highest users of energy are Canada, United States, Sweden, and then you can see some other countries that are much lower on the, on the spectrum. Again, some of the challenges are going to be when countries like India and China that have so many people move through industrialization and start consuming energy at the rates that we are, just the sheer number of people as those countries continue to grow is going to put a huge demand on our natural resources and ever more increasingly pollute the environment. Global energy consumption increases pretty much every year. Every year that goes by on this planet, there are more people, and therefore there is a greater demand on, uh, on our resources, particularly, again, our non-renewable resources like coal, oil, natural gas. The biggest increases, as I mentioned, are in countries like China and India, the two largest countries in the world that are moving through that demographic transition slowly. Developed nations um, tend to use more, but consumption isn't really increasing. Again, we've, we've already kind of peaked through industrialization. <clears throat> we are um, you know, more, more conservation-minded, even though we still use a lot of energy. So our consumption rates really aren't increasing largely because our populations aren't growing very rapidly. The world's energy requirements will, though, continue to increase every year when there are more and more people on the planet. So, going back to coal, I did briefly mention that it is the most abundant fossil fuel by far. Mostly it's found in the northern hemisphere. So, again, North America, much of uh, Russia and, and Europe, <clears throat> but also countries like Australia, India, South Africa also have fairly large deposits. The United States has about 25% of the world's coal deposits. So this is really the one resource that we far and away have the most of. And on average, it's predicted that we have at least 100 years and maybe even a lot more than that. If we were to continue using it at the rate we are now, we could use coal and we would have plenty for 100 years. Coal was used more heavily in the United States in the past than it is now. It was really sort of the building block of our country after wood earlier on. Coal was used for everything, producing electricity. It was used in everybody's homes to heat uh, homes in the winter time. It was used to produce steel. And uh, again, at, at the time when we first started using coal, lesser today, but when we first started using it, it was pretty much, it replaced wood, which was pretty much used for everything. Consumption has actually surged in recent years, not so much again in the developed countries, but in those two largest countries, China and India. Again, it's surging in those countries because it's the most abundant and the cheapest resource, so they can afford to buy it if they don't have enough of their own because it's fairly inexpensive. And again, because also it is the most polluting, it tends to uh, be a real concern for, for the rest of the world because as they use more and more of it, it's going to generate more and more pollution. And as we'll talk again about, we touched on this already earlier in the semester, burning coal in one place in the world can and does have an impact on the rest of the planet. It's not like it's only causing problems right where it's being used. So that much coal use in, um, in the Asian continent is going to have an impact on the rest of the world and particularly on North America with things like acid precipitation. A couple different ways that we mine coal surface mining which is within roughly the 100 feet or so of the surface. 
It's a, it's a process where first the soil is removed, then the subsoil, and then any, any rock strata that are above the vein of coal. And about 60% of the coal in the United States is, is uh, acquired this way. It's usually much safer for miners than having uh, subterranean mining, and it's cheaper to mine it this way. But between the, the, the two types of mining, surface mining is far more disruptive to the land for the reasons we just mentioned above. You're removing the soil and therefore you're completely disturbing the ecosystem above that area. So that disruption is going to continue until the mine is done. And in the past they would pretty much just kind of leave a hole there. Now they are required to reclaim mines, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little later, but, uh, but it's still a process that is very disruptive. Strip mining is one type of surface mining <clears throat> where, again, all the surface is stripped away, trenches are dug to get the coal out, and then basically all the, the rock and, and, and things that aren't... Uh, that are, are removed are, are dumped in nearby areas and just to get it out of the way. Subsurface mining are where they drill shafts. Uh, typically miners go down uh, into those shafts to, uh, to extract the coal. About 40 percent of the United States coal is mined in that method. Whether it's surface or subsurface mining, there are substantial environmental impacts of coal mining. And in addition to all of what we've already kind of touched on when it comes to actually then burning the coal. Again, we're losing the topsoil. Uh, and then, you know, we've got all kinds of erosion issues that occur because of that, that can even uh, result in it being very hard to reclaim a site or, or restore it once the mining is done. You lose the, the ability of, of an area to be stabilized by vegetation because that vegetation has been removed. Areas where this occurs are pretty prone to landslides. <clears throat> and then anytime you're digging a hole in the ground, whether it's a surface mine or a pit mine, you basically are now <clears throat> exposing minerals that can be leached out of the mine from rain and, and water that flows into the mine that are very toxic materials. Again, they're, they're naturally occurring things, but they were stored underground in a mostly kind of permanent situation. So suddenly digging a hole and exposing these minerals to the environment and then getting those oftentimes acidic um, minerals draining into nearby waterways that, that basically are things like sulfuric acid and other minerals that we find typically um, uh, in, in the mining process. Things like lead and arsenic, cadmium <clears throat> are, are again going to wash out of these mine areas and get into the nearby lakes and streams and rivers where they can basically kill every living thing in those areas if that acid runoff is strong enough. And then of course the, the uh, pollution that's caused by the silt runoff, the, the soil, combines then to basically have the ability to dramatically change the health <clears throat> of a stream or any waterway. There's a uh, type of mining that is probably the most destructive, which is basically akin to taking the top of a mountain off so that you basically have reached the area where the coal is. In uh, areas of West Virginia, 15 to 25 percent of the mountains have been leveled off. Half the peaks in that area will be gone by 2020. So it's a continuing process that Again, not only has all the other things we've already talked about, the acid runoff, the contamination, the erosion, landslides, but now you're, you're completely changing the landscape. And then not only are the mountains obviously affected, but the valleys and streams between the mountains 
basically can be obliterated by being filled in with all of the byproducts, what we call tailings, or other debris that's, uh, that's resulting from this mountaintop removal. And this process isn't only uh, limited to West Virginia, it's also happening uh, throughout uh, many of the eastern states. Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia are uh, the other states where this is a, a major concern. <clears throat> because of the environmental damage that we saw that was occurring because of this type of mining or surface mining in general, the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act was uh, um, enacted in 1977, which basically controlled what happened when a surface mine was done and, and basically abandoned. And so this act set standards for these mines that had to be followed uh, once they were no longer mining to then go through a, a series of processes that were able to um, define that the land should be reclaimed, soil be replaced, vegetation be reestablished, and basically leave the area looking as though there never was a mine there. <clears throat> so all of those are certainly big problems, but then as we've already talked about too, the actual combustion of coal contributes more air pollutants than oil or natural gas. So we tend to focus on the petroleum products like oil and natural gas as being polluting, and, and they are. <clears throat> but again, coal burning is, is worse than either of those. And there are still a lot of coal burning electric power plants, and those are responsible for about a third of all airborne mercury emissions, so a heavy metal that again, once that gets in the environment, it can be there a very long time because it just doesn't go away. We've mentioned things like the sulfur that, that is emitted by burning coal, but also the nitrogen oxides, which also are emitted in uh, burning fossil fuels and automobiles. And then again, these both react with, with the water vapor in the atmosphere to produce acid. And then that acid comes back to the earth as rain or snow. Coal burning also releases more CO2 into the atmosphere for every unit of heat that's produced than, again, petroleum products like oil or natural gas. So coal is really the most polluting in all respects. And again, even though now a lot of companies are talking about, you know, burning cleaner coal. Well, cleaner coal is really still not that great. It might be better than, uh, than the, the uh, lack of any sort of technology that we used to use to scrub away a lot of the pollutants. But again, if nothing else, the CO2 that's released, whether it's the quote-unquote clean coal or not, um, that is still releasing more CO2 than the other fossil fuels. So not a problem that we can really address by, by making it sound nicer, by calling it clean. So again, we've used a lot of technologies to scrub away some of the problems that uh, occur with burning coal. Scrubbers um, and, and chemicals react with the exhaust from the coal they precipitate out. In other words, the, the particles kind of collect and get too heavy, so they fall back uh, down into the system. And uh, so at least some of those um, particulates are removed. There's uh, what's called fluidized bed combustion, where basically coal is crushed and it's mixed with other things like limestone that helps uh, neutralize some of the acidic compounds that are otherwise produced. And so this does result in fewer of the nitrogen oxides, fewer but not, not completely gone, removes sulfur so it can really minimize the, uh, some of the uh, sources of the acid precipitation. And it does actually produce more heat per unit and so therefore it does reduce the CO2 emissions uh, but again does not completely stop these things. <clears throat> 
the Clean Air Act of 1990 actually uh, included some incentives for utility companies to convert to clean f uh, coal technology from the old standard technology. And so, again, a lot of companies have done this. And, and that's certainly much, much better than, than the way we used to combust coal without any of this technology. But again, that doesn't mean that it's uh, not polluting the environment. It still is a major pollutant. And again, the biggest challenge is when India and China continue to um, burn more and more and more coal, then even though we've reduced the overall emissions, we're still producing a lot of emissions because of the amount we're burning. Plus, again, they are not now and probably not into the future at least, will they be using the best technology? They're still burning the coal that's cheapest and easiest, that has the highest sulfur content, and, and are burning it in systems that don't have all the technology to reduce those emissions. So on to oil and natural gas. About 56% of the world's energy is supplied by oil and natural gas. In the U.S., it's a little more than that. If we look at the breakdown uh, of the other items then with, with, again, oil and natural gas being the bulk of our energy, 62%. Coal is second, which uh, is about a quarter. And then nuclear power. And then the sad thing is the, the, the area that we ought to really be focusing on, the renewables, and then things like hydro, wind, and solar um, are, are all just small percentages. Again, 7% um, total, 1% of it's biofuels, so about 6% of it is solar, wind, and uh, hydropower. So again, we've got this problem of us being so dependent on the non-renewable resources, the ones that will be gone eventually as opposed to the renewable resources that we can basically sustain forever. So petroleum or crude oil is the uh, material that we pump out of the ground or beneath the uh, deep oceans. And these are basically liquids that are composed of hydrocarbon compounds. And those hydrocarbon compounds then need to be refined and in that refining process, we're separating out the crude oil into different products based on the boiling point of those products. So the, the gases <clears throat> um, that we most of us burn in our automobiles, then jet fuel, then heating oil, diesel, and then some of the other products like asphalt. Again, all because they have different boiling points, and it's illustrated in the... Uh, image on the right side there and you can see the different layers that are separated out based on those boiling points <clears throat> a lot of petrochemicals as well that our society depends on we use oil to make a lot of other products <clears throat> besides just um, things related to automobiles fertilizers contain petrochemicals of course plastics paints pesticides, a lot of medicines, and then a lot of other synthetic compounds contain petrochemicals. We have over, over the decades, you know, slowly been looking for alternatives to products that were once pretty much completely made of petrochemicals. And so over time we have, uh, you know, found some things that we could substitute things that were less uh, damaging to the environment, particularly other synthetic materials. But again, still today, a lot of other products still are dependent on, ultimately, um, petroleum. <clears throat> of some of these non-renewables, natural gas has probably some of the better upside. Uh, it only contains a few hydrocarbons, Chemicals like methane are, are used for uh, heating buildings and generating electricity. Ethane, propane, butane are all other uh, forms of natural gas that are utilized um, for, again, the same things, generating electricity in some cases. 
or um, for those of us that live out in the country, we have propane tanks <clears throat> that get refilled occasionally in, in our stoves or anything else that's gas powered, runs off of propane. And then we also have LPG, liquefied petroleum gas. Propane and butane are separated and stored in pressurized tanks as liquids. And so they're a little more stable, a little easier to transport as LPG. Natural gas is, again, used for generating electricity, uh, where basically, um, ultimately, you know, the electricity and steam is used for heating water, for heating homes, that kind of thing, by circulating warm water through a piping system that, he, that just gives off heat. <clears throat> of course, transportation, although far less, of course, than uh, petroleum. But natural gas is used more in other countries for trucks and cars and buses. And it does have advantages that are pretty substantial over gasoline or diesel. It produces about a third of the carbon dioxide, up to 90 plus percent fewer hydrocarbons, 70 percent less carbon monoxide, and a 90 percent fewer toxic emissions with almost no soot. Again, lots of advantages, but um, and even though again the technology to convert engines to burn um, natural gas isn't that that hard to do, our country just really has not adopted this technology. In 2011, the U.S. had the U.S. had about 150,000 vehicles running on natural gas. Compare that to 10 million elsewhere in the world. So again, we, we are slow really to, to go down that road compared to the rest of the country. The time that I was in and out of Mexico doing my research, there were a lot of trucks down there. All the remote ranches often had their vehicles running on um, natural gas. They could have relatively large tanks in the back of the truck. They could go a long ways in between having to get that refilled. Plus, it was, at that time anyway, I'm not sure what the price is now, but it was cheaper even then uh, to use natural gas than, uh, than regular fuel or diesel. Again, it is used in commercial cooling and certainly in the production of plastics and fertilizers. Again, the main disadvantages with these petroleum products, the, this, you know, these fossil fuels, is that oftentimes where it's more abundant is often not very close to where the highest demand is. Again, we know that a lot of our fossil fuels come from um, Saudi Arabia, you know, the Persian Gulf, uh, elsewhere in the world as well. And so it's basically transported around the world and then it still has to be refined, and then it still has to be individually transported from the refineries to all the fueling stations. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's a lot more expensive to transport it than, than crude oil when you're looking at uh, moving it through pipelines because it has to be compressed into liquid uh, gas and then carried by refrigerated ships to keep it in liquid form and then has to be returned to a gaseous state at regasification plants. So again, it's, it's kind of, you have to keep changing the state of this stuff to be able to really transport it. And then on top of that, there are only four regasification plants in the United States. And it's estimated that we would have to have at least 40 for it to really be effective. 40 of these plants would probably have to be more equally spaced around the country so that again it wasn't so expensive to uh, transport it. Basically oil and, and the natural gases are found everywhere in the world but like a lot of our resources that we depend on they aren't uh, reserves aren't evenly distributed more than half of the reserves are in the Persian Gulf like I just mentioned 
uh, but then also, again, countries in South America, primarily Venezuela. Mexico has uh, reserves. Of course, the U.S. does too. Russia has a lot of, uh, of, of reserves as well. Um, about half of the natural gas reserves are in uh, Russia and Iran. Large oil deposits are under continental shelves in, in, in nearby deep water areas. And a lot of these are, are becoming increasingly difficult to get at because of, uh, again, our, our, our efforts, our, our desire to become independent of other countries when it comes to our, um, you know, fossil fuels. We've continued, obviously, looking at different ways to get, the, get at these resources. So one of the biggest uh, concerns that a lot of environmental groups have is this process of fracking which is more properly termed hydraulic fracturing. And basically these techniques have, have allowed us to change our estimates of how much natural gas that we might have access to. The environmental impacts uh, of fracking tends to be different than other extraction methods, but it's also expensive and again, still is very much um, disruptive to the environment. So certainly one of the uh, questions that we always look at is how long will our reserves last? And again, there is, the Earth is only so big. I mean, it's, it's huge, but it's, it's only so big. The fossil fuels that we're using now were once living things that under a lot of pressure and a lot of time, millions of years, have become fossil fuels. So it's really tough to predict how long the reserves will last. I mean, certainly we haven't discovered all the reserves that there are. We have pretty good ideas what we think there will be. But as we develop new technologies and, and have breakthroughs, we may find other reserves that um, we knew were there but we really couldn't access them but now we find a new technology that allows us to do that kind of like fracking um, or we just discover reserves that we uh, didn't know existed and then also we, we really can't predict the rate of consumption in the future we know countries like the US have slowed down in general and countries like China and India are, are very much increasing their demand uh, and so there's no real guarantee how long and how much uh, we're going to continue to consume these resources before we start using other of the alternatives. So it is tough to predict. However, if you look at kind of the optimistic prediction of global oil production, Again, it's kind of believed that probably the production will peak around the year 2035. So within about the next 20 years, we'll kind of hit a plateau of making, you know, refining and, and, and mining our, uh, our oil. Natural gas is more plentiful, uh, and so it's believed that probably the production of natural gas will continue maybe for another 10 years to, to increase after global oil production peaks. Uh, but, it, but again, it's just so difficult to predict. We talked about, you know, our coal reserves being 100 plus years. We talk about oil production peaking around 2035. That doesn't say anything about when uh, it might run out. There are a lot of people that say, well, you know, we, we've always come up with new technology, so I'm sure we'll have moved on to new technology that we can't even imagine today before we ever run out of oil or before we ever run out of natural gas. We'll move on to something better and renewable. But, again, I, I don't want to bet on that. I, I want us to be focusing on renewables now and getting away from these petroleum products sooner than later because of how damaging their use is to the environment and again the earth as a whole.
So again, this is kind of a complex um, series of images on this slide, but basically it's the energy consumption, the darker the color, the, the higher the, the, uh, the rate of consumption. And then in the bottom, uh, we uh, are showing the images that uh, relate to the production of some of the renewable energy sources like geothermal, solar, to generate electricity, and then the, uh, the potential, the, the red sort of bar, as the potential for more wind energy. Again, we'll be talking about those renewables when we get to the next chapter. But with our demand and with the potential for using more renewables to meet that demand, we really need to keep moving there, moving towards using renewables before we ever get close to running out of the, of the non-renewable resources, moving on to less polluting forms of technology. Interesting graph here too, the arrows show where um, you know the the uh, oil comes from and where it goes based on the uh, the, uh, the arrows and then the thicker the line the more uh, volume of oil so I, I always found it interesting that if you if you look at um, North America let's say not even just the US you see a whole bunch of arrows coming in and then actually interestingly enough there are a few arrows actually going out, mostly from production that's occurring in places like Wyoming. Um, but again, we, we import a lot and we export a little. I would argue or wonder, I guess, why we export any at all. If we're so bent on trying to become independent, you know, with respect to our energy demands, then why would we export any oil at all? Well, obviously it's to make money. But again, if we could use that to meet our own needs uh, more than we are, then why wouldn't we be doing that? We, uh, we talk about you know using more coal because we have a lot of coal. We have, uh, have been, been finding new reserves of natural gas kind of in the eastern seaboard and then in areas like the Dakotas we're expecting to have the ability to produce huge volumes of natural gas. But yet I'm amazed that the discussions I've heard is that we're going to export most of it to other countries, sell it to other countries. The benefit to us, though, that they argue is, well, we're still going to be generating jobs that will be for our people here in the United States, which is probably true. But again, if we can tap into a much cleaner resource, again, Natural gas is still a non-renewable resource, but it's a much cleaner non-renewable resource than petroleum. So if we have the potential to produce that much, why would we want to export most of it? But again, just a great graph because it, it really just shows how, how interdependent the uh, countries are with each other with respect to this one, but one very important resource oil. So we already know that CO2 contributes more to global warming than, than probably pretty much any other uh, compound. Each gallon of gas releases about nine kilograms of CO2 to the atmosphere. Every time I see car reviews today they not only talk about the mileage but they try to put it in terms that I think they think people will understand. How many barrels of oil will you use a year? How many tons of CO2 emissions? But again, they're just numbers to people. We don't really care or think about how many barrels of oil we're responsible for using or how many tons of CO2 our automobiles put into the atmosphere. But yet again, that's a, that's a super important thing because every one of us does contribute to global warming. Or if our homes are heated using electricity that was, that was generated by burning coal, then we're all contributing to acid deposition. Uh, just burning fossil fuels in our automobiles contributes to smog and nitrogen oxides. 
So certainly, again, anytime you burn oil, which primarily for most of us is our automobiles, we are creating environmental pollution. Again, relatively speaking, natural gas is clean. No sulfur, far less CO2 and hydrocarbons, virtually no particulates. But, um, but again, anytime you burn a fossil fuel, you are creating pollutants. But all in all, natural gas is a much, much better um, fossil fuel to burn for energy. And again, I go back to my statement on the previous slide. I, I'm just amazed that with all the discussion about all of the uh, natural gas reserves that we recently discovered we had here in the United States, that we're going to be exporting it as opposed to trying to use it here. Get rid of all the coal burning power plants and replace them with natural gas burning power plants. That would have a huge impact on the amount of pollution that's generated in this country alone. And again, with fossil fuels, there's a huge risk associated when you transport it in ships or pipelines around the world that there are going to be leaks and spills. There always have been, and despite the better technology requiring ships to have thicker hulls, multiple hulls, um, those kinds of accidents are still going to happen. In the United States, we um, basically had the biggest oil leak in the history of the planet to date. The deep water drilling platform that, that uh, exploded killed 11 workers and ultimately spilt 4 million barrels of crude oil. That's 4 million 50 gallon, I believe they're 50 gallon barrels of crude oil from the bottom of the ocean floor into the Gulf of Mexico where it basically got dispersed all over the place. Just on our country, just in the Gulf of Mexico, fisheries were disrupted. People lost their livelihood. People that were fishermen lost their livelihood. Uh, wildlife was, was killed by it. Extensive ecological damage to uh, our coastal wetlands estuaries, very important productive ecosystems that we've already talked about. And the stuff is still turning up uh, in places around the Atlantic Ocean and probably will for quite a long time. I was just trying to remember what I heard the latest estimate was as to how long it would probably take to ultimately uh, locate and clean up all of the oil, all of those you know, 20 million um, gallons of oil that uh, that have, you know, been spread around the Atlantic Ocean and all the islands and countries around there. <clears throat> so, uh, again, this um, map just shows a bit of a close-up of the trajectory for uh, the oil that uh, made it to the coastline and uh, all the red marks where oil actually got into the beach. You can see the pelican on the right that basically got coated with oil. Not quite bad enough that it couldn't fly at this point, but um, you get animals like that that get oil on them. It affects their ability to regulate their heat. They, they lose uh, body heat and, and then can die from hypothermia or they ingest the oil trying to get it off of themselves and of course it's toxic so that can result in death. Again, just a complete tra tragedy that uh, you know we obviously are always looking for, for better ways to do things and, and safer ways to do things but there, there's no way as long as humans are involved, that anything is going to be 100% safe. And when you're dealing with things like this that could be very damaging, it, it should be a little bit scary to all of us. And of course, unfortunately, that isn't the only oil spill we've had. The Exxon Valdez, which now, again, has been quite a long time, about uh, 260,000 barrels of oil that spilled about 11 million gallons of crude oil in the Prince William Sound area along the coast of Alaska, area indicated on the map there. 300,000 birds, 
three to almost 6,000 sea otters were, were killed by the oil. The orca and, and harbor seal populations declined dramatically. Salmon migration was affected uh, because again, they, you know, they just couldn't get inland getting up the rivers. Um, fishing season was actually halted because of the damage that the oil spill had done to the fisheries. And ultimately after the cleanup was done, as your book puts in quotes, the shores were still contaminated and continued to kill or damage uh, wildlife for quite a long time afterwards. The Oil Pollution Act of 1990 was, was one bit of legislation that wanted to uh, find a way to address major oil spills in the United States. They basically in, in, uh, increased the liability of damages to the resources from spilling oil which also then those damages would be uh, put into a trust fund that would help pay for the damages when the responsible party couldn't afford to pay for the damages. Which again, I guess I find that interesting. If you're an oil company, I can't imagine you can't afford to pay for damages because of the amount of money that those companies make. But anyway, um, that, that trust fund was uh, developed for that reason. Uh, as I also touched on a little earlier, it required double hulls on, on oil tankers that were entering U.S. waters by 2015. Not necessarily required for oil tankers in the rest of the world. Again, oil tanker sinks or leaks, uh, that oil doesn't have to be near the U.S. for it ultimately to have an impact on us. But again, we, we can't regulate the world so at least we're doing, I guess, what we think we can. We pretty much have, have agreed that the oil spill in the Gulf was the, the largest, but in reality, the largest oil spill goes back to the Persian Gulf War in 1991. Six million barrels of oil, six million barrels of oil were deliberately dumped into the Persian Gulf kind of as a spite. Oil wells were set on fire by their own people. Um, lakes of oil were spilled into the desert, around wells, and it may take more than a century for that area to ever recover. Again, going back to the Gulf War that, that people still to today insist wasn't about oil, and I, I think a lot of other people believe, of course, that it was all about oil. But um, again, that was a huge environmental catastrophe. And then you just look at some of the other uh, big ones. Um, 1910, an oil rig that hit a pressurized oil pocket in California. <clears throat> the, um, the, uh, the one we were just talking about above in 1991. And then some of the other ones we've, we've already talked about. So. Again, lots of oil spills, and these are just the biggest ones. There are lots and lots and lots of other ones that are much smaller that don't make the news or aren't big enough for, for maybe us to, to pay attention to. There was a time earlier in the United States when um, you know, the, the president at the time basically said, you know, we're entering the nuclear era, and, and he foresaw that our future in the United States, our future for energy would be nuclear energy. Of course, then with all the research that was going on, and, and then, you know, sort of finding some of the other challenges and problems associated with nuclear energy, we pretty much moved completely away from nuclear energy. There are lots of other countries in the world that still are building nuclear power plants and, and continue to depend on it pretty heavily, but um, we certainly have gone away from that. And the argument is that even though nuclear energy is still really quite safe, it doesn't create any air pollution, but of course we know the challenges are that the waste products are toxic, um, and if there's an accident, there's no such thing as a little nuclear accident. 
it can be really bad in a hurry, like Chernobyl. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going into, um, you know, sort of the the uh, chemistry of nuclear energy. Your book talks about that a little bit, but you basically generate energy by affecting the chemical bonds between atoms and basically nuclear energy specifically from the changes within the nuclei of an atom that generates heat and ultimately then can be used to power uh, turbines that makes electricity. There's two different types of nuclear reactions, fission and fusion. Um, fission is the process used in nuclear power plants. Fusion is the process that, that the sun uses to generate energy. And we continue to try and, and be able to generate energy by using the process of fusion, but, but we aren't, aren't there yet. Again, just a graph that kind of shows in a fairly simplified form kind of what fission looks like. <clears throat> Again, you can, you can kind of review this section of the book, but I'm, I'm not too worried about you just memorizing the whole process of, of fission. Of course, we recognize the word uranium. That is the ore that's used in nuclear fission. Um, it is a non-renewable resource still, like fossil fuels, but um, relatively speaking, you, you use much less of it to generate a lot of energy, pound for pound. Um, each pellet contains the equivalent energy to a ton of coal. So again, even though it's non-renewable, you don't use nearly as much of it. So again, fission of, of uranium-235 releases a lot of heat that's used to convert water into steam that spins a turbine that makes electricity. And nuclear power plants basically are using a controlled nuclear reaction. So typically when we talk about nuclear, we, we think of two things, either nuclear energy like nuclear power plants or nuclear bombs. Whereas nuclear energy is a controlled nuclear reaction, bombs are basically uncontrolled nuclear reactions. And the nuclear reactors that are used to, to generate energy don't contain um, anywhere near enough of the bomb grade type of uranium to cause a bomb type of nuclear explosion. Again, that, that still doesn't mean they're safe, but um, a lot of people have the misconception that a nuclear reactor could just blow up like a nuclear bomb and, and that's really not quite the case. Again, it doesn't mean they're 100% safe because like I said just a minute ago, anything that involves humans is going to have that little bit of potential for errors that are caused by humans. But, um, but again, relatively speaking, nuclear energy isn't a, a, a bad form of energy to use other than, and this is really important obviously, you generate a lot of very toxic material that has to ultimately be contained and stored forever. And that is clearly the downside of nuclear energy. It may not create air pollution, but it creates stuff that's never going to go away. You'll have to store it forever. Again, you can review the parts of a nuclear reactor. Nuclear power production has been steadily increasing, but again, not really much in the United States. And again, a lot of this has been because of the worries about climate change and because there's more and more demand for energy. Energy that isn't polluting like the fossil fuels that we use. In 2012, there were 435 nuclear power plants in 30 countries. 66 more were being built in 14 countries. Um, again, there are lots of supporters for nuclear energy and, and they believe we should make more of our uh, power plants, nuclear power plants, because they overall have a much lesser impact on the environment than fossil fuels. 
far less pollution, and again, no CO2, which as we already talked about, is the biggest contributor to, to a climate change. That also would then allow there to be much lower, much lower demands on foreign oil, which is kind of something that pretty much all of the countries, except for where the foreign oil is coming from, are, are pretty much uh, trying to find a way to, to deal with. Um, but again, the, the very big downside is that nuclear energy makes radioactive waste. The spent fuel rods, the fluids that are used to cool the reactor, uh, certain gases are all um, basically radioactive after they are used. And so it requires a lot of um, special type of technology to safely store it and, and, and ultimately dispose of it. And, and this, this data is, is really one of the sorts of uh, things that people that are for conventional nuclear fission uh, would, would lobby for. The amount of land that's impacted to, uh, to, do a, to make a thousand megawatts of energy, about ten times as much uh, land for coal, the daily fuel requirements, 9,000 tons of coal every day versus just six pounds of enriched uranium per day. The fuel availability, even as long as it is for coal, it could easily be that and maybe longer for uh, nuclear energy. Although, again, the waste products are going to be around for millions of years to come. Air pollution is low compared to uh, coal. And again, just most of the check marks are on the side of nuclear energy, other than um, you know the the basic disposal of that toxic waste. So again, we already talked about how nuclear power plants really cannot explode like a nuclear bomb, but the word we do know about is meltdown, when basically the metal that's encasing the uranium fuel gets too hot and can actually melt and then that water boils off and ultimately releases the radioactivity typically to the atmosphere where it could go you know for quite a distance away from where it was created again the nuclear industry itself considers the the chance of a major accident is pretty low very low probability, which, which is true. I mean, we've, we've proven that. But the public's perception of risk is much higher. It goes back to something we talked about way at the beginning of the semester, um, risk analysis. Again, nuclear energy is really fairly safe to generate, but we just focus on if an accident happens, it's going to be a bad one. It's that same idea between you know comparing airplanes and automobiles. If your automobile breaks down, you kind of coast off the road. If the airplane breaks down, everybody dies in a fiery crash. So even though plane accidents are far, far fewer than automobiles, we focus on that, that one fact. <clears throat> so people tend to be fairly distrustful of the nuclear industry. And again, we, we do know from experience that if there is an accident, the, the effects of that accident can be pretty dramatic and, and they can last for a long, long time. Worldwide, there basically have been three major nuclear accidents in the last 44 or so years. Again, you compare that to the amount of oil that's been spilled and, and some of the other um, you know things that have happened. That's pretty minor. But Again, we just keep envisioning Chernobyl, a whole town that was devastated, a whole region of a world that was affected to some degree by the, uh, the, the nuclear fallout. In the United States, of course, our uh, focus tends to be on the Three Mile Island incident, which was certainly the most serious uh, reactor accident <clears throat> in the United States. Back in 1979 in Pennsylvania, a partial meltdown of the reactor core, <clears throat> which resulted in some radioactive material being leaked 
Most of it was contained within the building and didn't get out. So there was no substantial environmental damage or uh, loss of life. But um, because of that, a lot of new regulations were put in place. It probably has uh, kept other accidents from happening, including much more frequent inspections, risk assessments, better plans for if emergencies happen. So certainly, as we all know from anything that happens bad, <clears throat> if we learn something from it and implement new policies that help further accidents from happening or lessening the impact, <clears throat> then at least we can look at that as, as somewhat of a good thing. <clears throat> and then as I've already mentioned about Chernobyl, a very severe accident <clears throat> that happened um, nearly 30 years ago now. A couple of explosions kind of tore the reactor apart. Lots of radioactive material got leaked into the environment and spread quickly to other parts of Europe. More than 170,000 people were forced to abandon their homes, <clears throat> land, water, uh, in, in a large area around the Ukraine was contaminated to the point where people uh, basically can't eat um, you know anything that's grown in the soil or the fish that live in the, the waterways uh, or the water at itself. Mothers can't nurse their babies because they have some level of radioactivity in their bodies that contaminates their milk and certainly then some of the some of the more um, scary side effects were the high uh, higher rate of birth defects that occurred particularly cancers like leukemia and thyroid cancer as well as a lot of other health issues uh, that that still affect people in the, in those areas <clears throat> certainly more recently um, the Fukushima um, incident that happened following the tsunami in March of 2011. Six, uh, three of the six reactors had meltdowns. Overheating led to hydrogen gas building up and then causing an explosion. Again, that contamination <clears throat> escaped out into the nearby ocean as well as land masses nearby. Areas have been permanently evacuated in that vicinity. Radiation clouds were released. Um, and certainly locally, the high radiation levels are going to limit the amount of um, fish and seafood that's going to be able to be consumed probably for decades to come. And still further concerns that maybe the leak was bigger than they originally thought or, or other things that might still have the potential to impact uh, us here in the United States. Um, so again, there, there, the other kind of major concern that a lot of people have with nuclear energy is the link between the materials needed to generate nuclear energy and to generate, build nuclear weapons. Again, fission is the process that both of these things um, are involved with. Countries that have nuclear power plants therefore have access to material that could be used for nuclear weapons. The spent fuel can be reprocessed into plutonium, which, which again is a fuel that, that can be used for nuclear weapons. And then certainly there's that concern that a lot of countries have about terrorist groups getting their hands on um, some of these types of weaponry or countries like Iran or North Korea that um, you know that that we're always worried about kind of what they're doing are they building nuclear weapons are they testing nuclear weapons and doing whatever we can to try and keep those types of uh, weapons out of the hands of countries like that so again when you have a process that can be used for good or for the worst of worse um, it, it's not hard to see why some people really can't separate nuclear energy and nuclear weaponry and are worried about it from, from both of those standpoints, the damage that that, that technology can potentially do. <clears throat> 
worldwide there are several hundred metric tons of plutonium and it really poses a security nightmare because just a couple of kilograms is all you really need for a bomb and again a kilogram is two pounds so smuggling you know a couple pounds of something could potentially be not that difficult compared to something that might take large quantities uh, and certainly there, there's huge amounts of security in the United States at our nuclear power plants and in the places where we have our plutonium stockpiles um, particularly going back after the uh, you know the 9-11 incident to make sure that there's a uh, minimal chance that anybody could get a hold of those reserves But again, probably the biggest issue that I've touched on already is the fact that, that this process generates waste that just doesn't go away very soon. Now, a lot of the waste that is generated by nuclear energy is low-level waste. Um, a friend of mine, uh, his dad worked in uh, New Mexico on, uh, on a lot of different nuclear projects, and so I got a little more insight from him vast majority of the nuclear waste that's you know trucked around to places where it's stored is is again low level waste it is produced by power plants or um, medical facilities that new use nuclear energy research labs there's you know this this is uh, these byproducts are stored at only four specific locations in the US and again they're low level because they give off pretty small amounts of radioactive energy. It's the high level radiation, the high level waste that is the bigger concern. This is produced during the fission in reactors, again the fuel rods, coolant, airs and gas that are that are uh, that escape from the reactor that are among the more dangerous of anything that that humans have ever made on this planet. Again, we create these wastes in order to generate energy and these wastes because of their hazardous nature are, are difficult to store they're, they're highly toxic and um, you have to basically guarantee a secure storage that's going to have to be able to to uh, to meet the needs not break down not leak for, for thousands of years at least and again we we may even continue to develop better technology than we have today in the future but um, certainly there's the ongoing concern that we've got all of this waste stored in those four facilities and concern for the future you know 100 years from now 10 years from now um, if those facilities start leaking just how serious that contamination could be if it leaks into the groundwater or you know any nearby waterway so the the typical storage system is is basically in areas where there's very stable rock formations that are deep below the ground um, areas that were maybe once used for mining or or things like that uh, again it's, it's another one of those NIMBY not in my backyard I may not mine nuclear energy, but don't store the nuclear waste anywhere near my house. So typically these storage facilities are, are pretty remote areas, and there are no long-term centralized storage facilities in the U.S. Again, there's, there's dispersed areas that are pretty remote. Uh, the commercial nuclear fuel plants store their own spent fuel on site but none of them are really meant to be long-term storage facilities and basically no countries in the world have successfully found or developed long long-term storage facilities for the high-level nuclear wastes as of when this book was published so it's a an ongoing challenge that people are trying to address because again there are a lot of countries that are continuing to use nuclear energy and even expand it so clearly we're going to be generating more waste in the future we're going to have to find a way to safely store that waste
So we see this certainly in the United States as, as the biggest obstacle. It's going to be decades before um, some of these deep underground storage facilities are developed. The Yucca Mountain project um, was decades in, in the works and, and never really panned out, for example. Back in 82, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act um, put the burden of developing these permanent storage sites on the federal government. Congress identified, as I mentioned, Yucca Mountain, Nevada, as really the only candidate for a storage facility. But as recently as 2009, uh, the Obama administration withdrew its support for that site. And, and at this point, there are no new sites that have been identified. Yet, billions of dollars were spent on studies that determined the feasibility of Yucca Mountain and other um, sites for whether or not they could serve as long-term storage facilities. Again, I would argue billions of dollars that could have been spent on a lot of, uh, of other things that could have had a bigger direct impact on the people of, of the United States. One of the biggest challenges that, that really led to this being shot down was transportation concerns. Again, the, the products would need to have been transported somehow from where they're generated at the facilities to the storage facility. And typically that would have been overground transport, trucks or trains. And there were a lot of concerns that this would be perfect targets for terrorists. They could if they found out kind of the schedule, not that there would have been a regular schedule, but if they could have kind of tapped into the system and identified trucks that were carrying these hazardous waste products, and if any of them got anywhere near a bigger city or an important waterway or something, they could have blown up the truck and had a, a, an ability to do a lot of damage. So certainly transportation of the nuclear waste from you know where it's generated to where it would be stored was was a major challenge that we haven't uh, fully addressed obviously we know that deep underground storage ultimately is the safest and best long-term option but uh, but again we've got a long ways to go apparently before we can really get a handle on this issue so then we end with uh, with the nuclear waste nightmare environmental enviro discovery. Uh, for the past 30 years, uh, Russia basically have violated international standards for how they uh, deal with radioactive waste, and they've been pumping it underground, directly underground, not in any kind of containment facility, apparently. Uh, waste has been dumped in the ocean, and, and again, just huge potential health hazards and probably a lot of things that we don't even know how how they could affect us or for how long they could affect us into the future and again it's these kinds of its incidents that most people will point to and say why would we ever want to have nuclear energy when we have fossil fossil fuels at least for now and then much much better options for the future like solar power wind power and other of the renewable resources that we'll be talking about in the next chapter. So um, certainly we uh, and, and many other countries have um, spent a lot of effort in decommissioning power plants once they've kind of lived past their, uh, well not past, but when they've reached the end of their normal lifespan. A lot of you know, important parts become brittle or corroded, and ultimately they're going to fail if they aren't uh, decommissioned. So there basically are three options, either storage, which basically uh, means that once the facility is shut down, um, you still have to basically guard it for maybe up to 100 years while you wait for those radioactive materials to just break down naturally and then after that 100 years, the, uh, this, the power plant then would be much safer to be able to take it apart. Um, typically, one of the most common options that I've heard of is entombment, which basically means that when we shut the plants down, 
we basically bury it in concrete. Now again, the challenge there is that that tomb would have to remain viable. In other words, it would have to be able to contain that facility for a thousand plus years. And, and generally, again, you can imagine that's really not a very viable option. Planning on, you know, building a cocoon around something that's supposed to last for more than a thousand years. Um, and then there's basically taking it apart immediately, using robots to dismantle it. Um, that way, again, it's feasible as opposed to not being able to use humans. So there are those three options. Um, what they're trying to do now in Chernobyl is basically entomb it. Uh, they've used robots to, uh, to build structures and, and do some of the stuff in the hot sections, but they are basically trying to build a concrete dome over it for now, uh, and they see that as the best option in that case anyway. <clears throat> Again, it's been our, our goal to, to become less dependent on foreign oil. And again, we could do that by using th things other than oil. But there are still um, a lot of people that believe there are, and, and there are, a lot of other untapped oil resources in our country. And one of those untapped resources is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It was kind of labeled as America's Serengeti. It's, a, it's a, an interesting, fragile ecosystem. It talks about it being biologically rich, which, which it is, but it's also very far north. It's a tundra. So there are unique and interesting species up there, not diverse like a rainforest, but, but still a unique ecosystem. <clears throat> and so for a long time now, decades, we've been fighting between the environment and the economic benefits of drilling for oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Supporters believe, again, economically, it'll make us less dependent on foreign oil. People that don't buy that believe that the amount of money that's going to be spent on exploring and, and developing those resources up there would be better spent developing renewable resources, renewable energy resources, and even putting more money towards ener uh, energy conservation. And ultimately, that kind of impact on a fragile ecosystem could really create a permanent threat to the balance of that ecosystem because of how fragile it is. Colder climates like that, the environment doesn't heal quickly if it's damaged. And so uh, the, the amount of damage that could be done up there certainly would not heal anytime soon. Again, just an image there to, to kind of show you where the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is, um, our National Petroleum Reserve up there in the very northern part of Alaska around Prudhoe Bay. Um, we know we get a lot of oil resources from Alaska and because of how much oil is, is uh, pumped from that very northern part of Alaska, that's why it was worth building that Trans-Alaska Pipeline, basically pi piping that uh, oil from the far northern part of Alaska to the southern part of Alaska, where then it can be uh, loaded on ships and, and sent elsewhere to be processed and utilized. So again, there's that balance between, you know, leaving the refuge alone, letting nature do its thing, versus the potential upside of, of harvesting oil from it. National Geographic did an article on this issue oh, quite a few years ago, probably 10 years, 12, probably even longer than that, I think, probably more than 12 years ago. And they were showing a graph of the amount of demand that we in the United States have for oil, and the amount of oil that <clears throat> the uh, Arctic National Wildlife would contribute. And it's just a little tiny blip in the demand of oil that we have. The amount of oil, as big as that area is, the amount of oil wouldn't make us independent from uh, you know, foreign oil. It would only provide a little fraction 
of our uh, demand for oil. So if it only provides that little a bit a little bit of oil, is it really worth the potential damage to that fragile ecosystem?